A platoon of U.S. Navy SEALs gathers around the sparse cover at the base of a hill. The commanding officer receives a last-minute transmission and turns to his men with a grave look on his face. Despite being in almost constant action for the last four days and with only four hours of solid sleep to each man, the orders are in. The SEALs must take the hill. Leaving it in enemy hands would endanger friendly forces elsewhere. With grim determination, the SEALs check and double-check their equipment. They've got a job to do, but as the attack kicks off, the weary men are in for a shock for what awaits them. Machine gun rounds whiz over their heads as artillery drops just meters away. The ear-deafening explosions make them lose track of where they are or where they're going to. The smoke burns their eyes and blurs their vision, but that will not stop them from reaching the enemy position on the hill above. The only problem is getting there. To do so, they must crawl through hundreds of yards of mud and barbed wire, sometimes sinking all the way up to their neck in dirty water or mud. And if that was not enough, they must crawl through over a hundred feet of piping filled with muddy water and possible snakes to get through to the other side. But even if they survive the hundreds of yards of fire-swept barbed wire fields and muddy ditches they must crawl through, the final obstacle is a rope bridge they must cross under fire and ensure that no man is left behind. Despite all these challenges, the men persevere and take the hill with no casualties, the unseen enemy retreating before they could engage in the close combat the SEALs desperately wanted. While this scenario might come straight out of a war movie, it's actually based upon the culminating event of Basic Underwater Demolition School, or BUDS, Hell Week. It's a testament of their combat training so far and incorporates lessons learned from the entire week while teaching the aspiring SEALs that even when they're the most tired, exhausted, hungry, and weak, the most will be expected out of them. Combat is unforgiving and does not care what they've already gone through. Even though the scenario sounds intense, it actually is just a very small piece of what actually goes on at BUDS throughout the seven months the trainees, affectionately known as tadpoles by their instructors, attend one of the most difficult training programs on the planet. From day one, SEAL instructors are looking to maximize attrition, and for good reason. There's a high probability that today's trainee could be serving alongside an instructor tomorrow in an active duty SEAL team abroad. So while their methods might seem intense, out of the ordinary, or downright sadistic, they all serve the common purpose of crafting some of the world's finest warriors and ensuring those that do not want to be there quit. While that event might seem tough, the entire process from beginning to end is meant to find each trainee's limit and then exceed that every day. Before training even begins, all prospective SEAL candidates must attend what's called INDOC. INDOC is a five-week precursor to BUDS that each person must pass just to begin training. It's here that candidates receive their first taste of the SEAL community. Their days are long and regimented, usually starting at 5 o'clock in the morning and ending 12 hours later. During those 12 hours, they're constantly being pushed physically. Whether it's group runs on the beach wearing boots and oots, also known as camel pants, doing group exercises, swimming for hours in the pool, basic diving, or tackling the obstacle course, the instructors unleash a full barrage of training to get the most out of their students. While those might sound easy at first, the instructors have a way of making even the simplest of tasks impossibly difficult. For instance, as a part of their swimming qualification, students must learn the practice of downproofing. The purpose of this is to expose students to a variety of controlled in extremis, Latin for the point of death situations, to see how they react. Students must also be able to get to the surface safely if any of their gear fails while on a mission in the water. There are a couple of ways to do this, and one of the most common is having students tie their feet and hands together, then jumping into the pool to free themselves before they pass out. Another way instructors place students in extremists is by purposefully pulling off their diving equipment while in the pool, and then watching as the student clears and replaces it back in working order. Useful for sure, but definitely not for the faint of heart. The terror in the pool does not end there. Another seemingly impossible task is to swim 50 meters underwater. While that might sound easy, it's not uncommon for students to pass out during this evaluation. The obstacle course is another not-so-easy task. There's a wide range of high and low obstacles that require agility, speed, and endurance to conquer, including an almost 60-foot rope tower to climb. Making matters worse is that in BUDS it pays to be a winner and the weakest students are often punished severely with more exercises and mind games, with the slowest runner of the obstacle course usually being buried up to his neck in the sand by his classmates. While the instructors in INDOC might seem like they're trying to humiliate and beat down the students for no reason, in reality they're beating them down only to build them back up. The best way they do this is by assigning each student a partner known as a swim buddy, 
which is to remain with him at all times. Each swim buddy cannot be more than several feet away at a time, and if they do, each person risks fear of expulsion from training. This selfless devotion to another is the beginning of creating a coherent team. By indoctrinating students now that at the end of the day all that matters no matter how tired, stressed, or in pain they are is the person beside them, only then can they truly begin to grasp what it means to work in a team. Those that cannot grasp the concept or who psych themselves out now leave the program. Once a prospective SEAL makes it through INDOC, the next most grueling phase begins. The first phase builds upon most of the skills learned in INDOC and pushes trainees past any sort of mental or physical breaking point they might have thought they had before. It's here that the students are first introduced to some of the SEAL pipeline's most legendary challenges. The first challenge they must overcome now and almost every day throughout their training is the infamous PT arena called the Grinder. The Grinder does not look imposing at first. It's merely the asphalt courtyard in between where all the men live in their barracks. One would not even know of its use as an epic training ground minus the various pull-up and dip bars that adorn its sides. But make no mistake, many thousands of men have been made and broken upon it. Each day the men will train on the grinder. Thousands of push-ups, crunches, pull-ups, burpees, and other bodyweight exercises will be done here. But that's not all. Throughout their time here, instructors will continuously spray them with water to ensure their whole time spent here is wet. While this might seem refreshing in the scorching California summers, at night and in the winter it just adds another layer of misery. Speaking of being wet, this is one constant that trainees can count on their entire time at BUDS. In fact, the instructors give it an affectionate name, wet and sandy. Whenever a trainee fails to perform or even at an instructor's whim, the men can be forced to run into the surf and roll around to make sure their entire bodies are covered in sand and water. The added discomfort of the gritty sand and the chafing to follow serves as a constant stressor to the environment. The punishment of the first phase goes beyond just expanding the physical torment of Indoc, but the teamwork aspect as well. Now SEALs are broken up into roughly six-man boat crews to an inflatable small boat, or IBS. The IBS is one of the foundational platforms SEALs must conquer, since this small, silent craft is what they use to creep up on enemy shorelines across the world. The IBS weighs several hundred pounds, and once seawater and sand are factored in, it feels like it weighs a ton since it's required to be carried over their heads wherever they go. The boat team is expected to work together to accomplish tasks. Those that perform well are usually rewarded with extra rest or warmth, while those that fall behind will face a variety of punishments from before as well as a new one, rock portage. The beaches of Coronado are adorned with hundreds of rocks that jut out menacingly into the shoreline. Often as a punishment or at the direction of the instructors, boat crews are forced to row into the waves by these rocks and get smashed into them as the undertow flips their boats in the air. The punishments here go far beyond just physical though. For those that fall behind or fail to complete the events on time, they are assigned to what's called the Goon Squad. The Goon Squad is the slowest and lowest performing group of candidates in a class. These men are singled out for their extra remediation and punishment workouts that slowly suck their resolve. Here men are usually forced into a downward spiral since the extra time it takes to complete these workouts puts them further behind everyone else still working toward the events of that day. Ultimately, very few men sent to the goon squad will ever regain their place amongst the rest of the class. Further compounding the mental torture is the ever-present bell. The bell sits in the center of the grinder and is a constant reminder that getting out is only three rings of the bell away. Any trainee at any time can walk up to the bell to quit. Doing so ends their misery but closes the door to the SEAL community forever. For those that manage to make it to the end of the first phase, there's one last event remaining that sends a chill down the spine of all who know its name, Hell Week. Hell Week is the culminating event of the first phase. It's a brutal event encompassing a continuous week-long beatdown that tests the mind and body of all those who dare partake in it. The week starts with the men eating a large meal for dinner and then going down to their cots in the tents on the beach. The instructors give them a few frightful hours of sleep until sometime, usually around midnight, an instructor busts into the tent with an M60 machine gun firing blanks and throwing a flashbang grenade, telling the trainee to start running. This event, known as the breakout, signals the start of Hell Week. Throughout the entire week, the men will complete many of the events they've done before, only now they'll have no rest. The men are allowed two two-hour naps twice throughout the whole evolution. 
The chronic sleep deprivation makes them feel disoriented and hopefully lose focus on the pain and only on the next event. By the end of the week, those who did not quit or get dropped for medical reasons face their last challenge of a simulated combat scenario known only as Not So Sorry. Once this is complete, Hell Week is over and the next phases of their training can resume. While the next two phases are no less grueling than the previous two, they are challenging in their own ways. Most of each class will drop out by the end of the first phase and very few leave during the next two. Just exactly why that is, is probably because learning the actual skills of advanced diving and small unit tactics are things that can be taught, while the mental and physical toughness of being a SEAL is something students either have or do not.